And uh, since we're on the topic of purification, um, now we'll do our little um, supplemental section on fire pujas because the point of fire, fire pujas is to purify. Okay. So, fun fact, <laughs> there are three kinds of fire pujas. So they're related to um, different kinds of fire related practices. So something is burning in all three cases, okay? So one is called sang, another is called sir, and another is called jinseng. So these three, um, inside of each, there are many subdivisions and subdivisions as you would expect. But the major principle of fire pujas is offerings. So you put the food and whatever ingredients in the fire, the fire burns it, so fire eats it. Then it is totally consumed, so that is the way of offering. So in the Sung Puja, you're offering the smoke. So Sung Pujas, you will see often right before a Lama comes, there'll be a huge um, sort of barrel of incense billowing to welcome the Lama. And sometimes there's also a practice that goes along with that, or sometimes they're just offering beautiful incense smoke. Song pujas um, are often done on His Holiness's birthday, and uh, that's the most common time you'll probably see them done in our tradition. There's the Sur Puja, which is the offering of smell. And Sur Pujas are mostly to benefit hungry ghosts. So in the hungry ghost realm, they have many karmic obscurations to connecting with resources, but they can eat through smell. And so usually we're burning barley, butter, raisins, um, things that smell nice when you burn them. And then in the ginseng, you are just offering fire itself, flame itself, burning itself. So, you know, fire pujas are of many types. Um, the one you're probably curious about is this one where there's a hearth and there's a big fire and there's someone sitting behind a fire shield and there's a giant bucket of butter. I'm guessing this is the one you're curious about. So this is what it looks like before it begins. So the shield has a little symbol. The symbol is bam, and that's the symbol for water. And so having the symbol for water plus a shield protects the practitioner from getting burnt. And then in the very beginning, there's a helper who lights the fire by putting a tiny fire into the fire. And then when the fire is underway, you'll see the retreat leader is reading from a ritual text and the fire is pretty darn big, but it isn't that big throughout the whole ceremony, but you know, there's butter involved, so it's gonna whoosh. So tantric retreats and fire pujas go together. So a tantric, a retreat commitment usually entails performing what's called a serviceability retreat or a leirung. Completing such a retreat together with its concluding fire puja makes our minds serviceable with the Buddha figure and its practice. So serviceable means able to take the self-empowerment or self-initiation to purify and renew our vows, to qualify for performing other rituals of the Buddha figure, and if we fulfill additional requirements to confer any of the three initiating ceremonies to others. So these retreats are um, often have a numerical count that go with them where you have to do a certain amount of the deity's mantra. And at the end, you do the fire puja to purify mistakes. So during a serviceability retreat, we repeat the mantras of the main Buddha figure several hundred thousand times each, depending on the practice and the number of syllables in the mantra. So for example, 1,000 arm Chen Rezig, um, you would do 600,000 of his mantra on one seat. We also repeat the mantras of the associated mandala figures 10,000 times each. This is related to highest yoga tantra. So we might do this in the context of four, three, two, or one session a day, usually four. During each session, we recite the sadhana like what we've just recited. And we might omit certain small portions in the middle two sections and kind of go straight to the mantra part after motivating. 
If we are practicing four sessions a day, we restrict our movements within a limited perimeter around our homes, and we restrict the number of people we may meet during the retreat. So all of this about a boundary or a perimeter and doing things within one seat is to develop a concentrated practice to not diffuse the energy of the practice. So then a fire puja is an offering of a large number of specific substances which are tossed into the fire or offered into the fire during an elaborate ritual. So we visualize ourselves in the form of the Buddha, or the one that we've been doing the retreat for. And then we visualize the fire in the form of Agni, the fire deity. And this is a, a figure common to both Buddhism and Hinduism. And the Buddha figure of our practice is at Agni's heart. So the fire puja burns off or purifies any mistakes we may have made during our retreats and bonds us even more closely to the Buddha figure. So if you're doing a Chenrezig retreat, you visualize yourself as Chenrezig, you visualize Agni in the fire with Chenrezig at his heart, and it's to purify mistakes you've made during the retreat and um, come even more closely bonded to Chenrezig, for example. So then Agni, he's depicted as this red-skinned, riding a lamb with a halo of flames emerging from his crown. He's sometimes shown bearded. He has a rosary in one hand and an ax, a torch, a fan, and others, and jumping down. The term Agni is part of Buddhist texts, but not in the sense of the Vedic god, more in the metaphorical sense of inner heat and appears as Agni Kumara in the theory of rebirth in Jainism. And he's also one of the 51 Buddhist deities found in Tibetan Buddhism mandala for Medicine Buddha. So there's a tiny outline of Agni here that you can sort of see. But basically, you think that he is like the bridge between you and the Buddha to help you purify mistakes during the retreat. And he's helping to like facilitate the purification process. So you start with a hearth and you draw a simple form of the mandala of the deity that you've been practicing. So not the full elaborate one, like you would see the Gyudo monks doing, um, like before his holiness's teachings, for example, but like this very simplified version with just the seed syllable at the center or various other things might be in the center, an eight petaled lotus, and then a Vajra fence. And then outside are some protection things. And then on top of that, you build the fire and you put little flowers all around um, as offerings to Agni. And in this case, we're doing a pacifying fire puja, so the flowers are white. And then it's lit and it looks like this. And over to the side in the brass bowls, you can see some of the offerings that are about to be added to the fire. And it, this is, you can sort of see in this one, the pile of grains once they've been offered, or at least some of them. And it's, uh, it becomes a very, very hot fire, but each of the grains that are offered represent a particular quality that we want to have, um, a particular realization we want to have, and a particular thing that we want to purify. So here's some of the grains. You have things like mustard seeds and rice and sesame seeds and uh, barley and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they're divided into different ways. Um, you'll see kind of uh, different plates and bowls of the same substance. And this is because fire pujas go in three rounds. So the first round is to Agni, the fire deity. The second round is to the specific deity that you've been practicing, like Chenrezig. And then the third round is for Agni, the fire deity, again in thanks. There are also um, specific grasses and sticks that get offered. For example, long life grass is like um, derva grass or um, crab grass. It's that very, very sturdy grass with lots of kinks in it that usually takes over your garden. And it's very robust. So it represents long life. So that's one of the offerings, for example. And 
during the practice, there are a lot of portions where ghee or clarified butter are offered again and again. And uh, it's said that Agni has a particular fondness for ghee. And so that's why it's such a nice offering. It of course also helps everything burn. Okay. So that is a very quick explanation of fire pujas, but they are something that come up at Dharma centers. They're particularly for, um, I guess, more long-term practitioners, but um, it could be that the first time you do one, you're doing it in a group. And so someone is really walking you through it. Sometimes you don't even see the text. The Tibetan Lama is doing the whole thing on your behalf. And so you think Agni is helping to connect me and the deity. The Lama is connecting me to the Lama, to the Agni and to the deity. So the Lama is facilitating a process that Agni is facilitating for the deity. So the Lama is your representative in a lot of the cases. And then it might be all in Tibetan and there might be various helpers bringing things and taking things. Sometimes the students will have an opportunity to participate and offer into the fire, usually in the middle round to the deity themselves. Um, occasionally you'll get a small enough group retreat where everybody can do the whole ceremony together or you have enough time in the day where everyone can do the ceremony together. Um, in, if someone is uh, with a Western teacher, it's probably more likely that you'll get the ritual text in English and everybody can do it together simultaneously. So there's benefits in having a Tibetan Lama facilitate it. There's benefits in having a Western teacher facilitate it, but uh, some of these practices are translated into English. But basically lots of grain, lots of grass, lots of things offered into a fire, all of it symbolic of purification. Somebody asked about fire puja. Oh, it was Colleen, sorry. Did, was that answering your question or did you have other thoughts? Pretty much. The only other question I have left then is um, the one time I did attend, uh, we were given black sesame seeds and we were told to shape them in the shape of a scorpion. That is a Dorje Cadro. Yeah. Yes. And I had no idea why we were doing that. And you think, poor scorpions getting a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> So um, that's like a mini fire puja. So um, big approach retreats or serviceability retreats will have a big fire puja. It takes like two, three, four, five hours, can take quite a long time. And there's a lot happening. Um, what you're describing is a Dorje Kadro, which is a really excellent purification practice to do quickly. And the only thing you're offering to the fire is black sesame seeds. And basically you're thinking that black scorpion is the representative of all your negativities. And then you offer all your negativities to the mouth of Dorje Kadro, who goes yum and burns them up. It's, it can be really a powerful thing to have a tactile and a visual representation of your mistakes. And so we pick something like a black scorpion because people find it scary. Scorpions, of course, have Buddha nature just like everybody else. And, you know, sorry, scorpions, you get a bad rep, but it's because they're scary. That's why they're chosen. Yep. So you take your black sesame seeds, you shape it into a scorpion. You think all your mistakes are embodied by that image. And then you offer it to Dorje Kadro, who helps you burn them up. And that's the power of the remedy for that kind of practice. There is a mantra and a visualization. And there's just also a tactile element as well. So fire pujas don't come up that often. They're, they're usually at the end of the big retreats, which are like three weeks to a month long or three months long. Um, and if you're in a group, you're not going to be expected to know what you're doing. The, the retreat leader will walk you through it and tell you what's happening. Yeah, but they all go the same basic format. Offerings to Agni, offerings to the deity, offerings to Agni. And it's a repeated process. So once you've done one round, you're like, oh, that's what's happening. Okay. So uh, more on purification. So Vajrasafa, I think you guys know, there's also forgiveness verses in like various sadhanas or pujas. And the visualizations are very similar to what you see in Vajrasafa. So in Vajrasafa, you have yourself, you're the monk, right? You're the monk and Vajrasattva is above the crown of your head. He sends down streams of light when you have generated the power of regret. 
And as he sends down streams of light for um, negativities of speech, clouds of smoke and soot, um, for negativities of, or excuse me, of body and of speech, you have, you know, pus and blood and stuff, and then you have mind with scorpions and stuff. Sometimes they're exchanged around, it depends on your sadhana. You can do just the simple smoke and tar for everything, but the idea is that by being flooded with light, you're pushing out the mistakes. And then those mistakes all go into the earth and pacify Yama, the Lord of Death. Yama, the Lord of Death is of course just karma and disturbing emotions. We give him a scary form, but really we're talking about karma and disturbing emotions. And then the earth closes back up and you're happy and clean, clear. And then you get filled up with nectar light. And then Vajrasattva dissolves and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. So if you're doing, um, say, Tara Puja, and towards the end, there's an uh, invitation to recite the Padmasattva mantra, for example, or, um, yeah, it'd be the Padmasattva mantra. So you say Om Padmasattva Samaya Manapalaya, which is just like the Vajrasattva mantra, only with Padme instead, because Lotus family, you're doing that same exact visualization, right? You just think Vajrasattva is now Padmasattva, streams of light, flushing me clean, all the mistakes in general, but particularly if during the retreat or during the um, puja, I got grumpy, <laughs> or during the puja, I got annoyed and I wanted it to go faster, or I wanted it to go slower, or the person next to me annoyed me, or I got vague and I spaced out. It, it really helps you feel like you didn't waste your time by doing this puja just because you weren't perfect. So there's little shorty forms of purification woven into practices that aren't explicitly about purification. So you're gonna find that commonly throughout lots of different prayers and practices, a section where you're doing a version of the Vajrasattva mantra, a section where you're requesting forgiveness, which is of course given before you even ask, but helps your own mind and then move on. There, it's very short a lot of the time. So if you're wondering, what am I supposed to do here? White light flushing you clean, <laughs> pacifying the Lord of death. Yeah, then filling up with, with blessings and realizations. Vajrasattva or Padmasattva dissolves and absorbs into you. And it's so quick, you know, it's just the length of three mantras sometimes. Sometimes there's not even a nice little forgiveness verse. It's just three times the mantra. But you get so used to that visualization, you can connect with it quite quickly without having to think about it too much. So it's just familiarity. Is it making sense? You've seen this sprinkled throughout various practices? Yeah, so short purification practices to pur purify any mistakes made during the practice. Like that. Okay.